Hello, everyone watching and listening. Today, I have the privilege of speaking with women's rights activist Kelly J. Keene, also known as Posey Parker. We discuss the co-opting and invading of women's spaces, the hatred, jealousy, and attraction toward what women naturally possess, which underlies the transgender movement, the rise of false compassion as a means to censor and control, what Posey Parker aims to accomplish with her Let Women Speak events, and how social pressure, ideologically captured police, and terrorizing mobs have not and will not silence her. Thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me today, Kelly J. Um, d- uh, tell me about the name Parker Posey first. So when I was expecting one of my babies, that was there were two names on her list, um, Posey and Parker. And so when I joined an online forum, I just used those as a anonymous name, and it stuck. Uh, but I go with my real name these days. I see. Okay. And so do you want to, maybe you could let everybody uh, who's watching and listening know a little bit about you. Um, and I don't know much about you. I've read your, your, your Wikipedia page and done some background <laughs> research as well. Um, mm-hmm. you, you sound like quite the monster when you read your Wikipedia page, but it's a Wikipedia page. So, uh, you know, that's, that, that has to be taken with the requisite grain of salt and we can go through that. I mean, I, it's quite interesting, for example, that you're described as an anti-transgender rights activist. That's pretty convenient for the people who don't like what you're saying, right? That you're an anti-transgender rights activist. The left, you got to give the leftist radicals a certain amount of credit for being able to warp language like nobody's business. So, but, but who are you and why are you doing what you're doing? So I am a mother of four and a happily married woman. Um, I've been with my husband for 25 years. And then in 2015, this issue came along. I was a full-on Labour voting lefty. And uh, I joined an online forum of women. And then loads of men started populating it. And unlike the women who actually were completely uh, ineffective in their campaigning, uh, unlike the men Uh, Women weren't talking about themselves, what they looked like. They weren't posting photos, but these men did. And they were really masculine-looking men with wigs and sort of 1980s secretary looks. And uh, I just asked one of them one day, do you really identify as a woman? And the vitriol from him was bad enough, but from other women was just astounding. Uh, And I just thought, well, I'm not allowed to talk about this, so I want to talk about this. And I'm not having anybody telling me that I can't talk about something so significant. And then I just started. Uh, 2018, I put a billboard up with a dictionary definition of the word woman. And that really sort of solidified my place in this movement. Yeah, the billboard, that was uh, adult human female? Yeah. Hateful. Yeah, well, that's pretty... Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, okay. So you said a couple of things there that I found interesting. So that... um, the first was that you asked one of these men who was in this woman's forum whether or not he identified as a woman and received a lot of hate and vitriol in response. So, well, first question is, do you feel that you crafted your question in a manner that might have invited that sort of response or what other explanation do you have for it? And then the second thing you said, which I think is equally relevant, is that Not only did you receive a lot of vitriol from the person to whom you directed the question, but you received excess vitriol from women. And so, first of all, let's inquire into the question that you posed to see if there was anything provocative about it. And second, I'd like to hear your thoughts on why you have experienced the fact that women are very likely to jump on this particular bandwagon, for example, and provide uh, noisy and self-righteous support for the people that you are hypothetically pillorying. So let's start with the question. Like, do you feel that you asked a fair question and to, of, this, of this particular man? I actually don't think I asked a fair question. I, and that's because my knowledge in 2023 means I think it probably wasn't provocative enough. I think I should have basically not asked the question, do you identify, but just told him that he wasn't a woman and it was insulting to pretend to be one. 
Um, so yeah, I, it was the wrong question, but I've learned a lot since then. Uh, as for women, I think I'm supposed to say as a women's rights campaigner that women are um, oppressed under the patriarchy and therefore they're just trying to struggle to get their place at the table. And I don't think it's that. I think it's currency. And I think the reason women compete in who can be the quickest to give women's rights away is because then they have currency of being these really nice people. And and I think women are uh, often use psychological warfare and ostracizing and niceness, shall we say, as a strategy to to win against other women. So that's why I think women do that. So, well, two things about that. So there is a pattern of antisocial behavior among women that's been well documented in the relevant psychiatric research. And so antisocial men tend to use, to devolve towards physical violence, but antisocial women use gossip, malicious slander, and reputation savaging. And so that's been documented for decades, and that's the female pattern of antisocial behavior. But you tied it into something, you tied it into currency, you know? And so I want to tell you a little story. So I interviewed this very deep religious thinker. His name is Matthew Pajot, and he wrote a book called, what is it, The Sacred? I'll, I'll remember it momentarily. Um, it's about Genesis. And I talked to him about the sin of Eve in the, in the story of the Garden of Eden. And it's a sin of pride, right? It leads to the fall. And the sin of pride is that Eve proclaims that it's something like she can even clasp the serpent to her breast, the poisonous serpent. So imagine that it is the case that women are caregivers and especially caregivers of infants and that their ability to provide care is one of their true strengths, but it's also a potential source of status. And so a woman who wants to make a false and prideful status claim can claim that her maternal embrace is so all-encompassing that even the serpents can be included. Right now, the next thing, of course, that happens is Adam hearkens to her claim and I think what happens there is that men will enable women by telling them that their desire to embrace even the poisonous is laudable and that the social structure, which is what Adam's responsible for, say, in the Genesis story, the social structure can be modified to accommodate to their wish. Of course, that precipitates the fall, all of that. And so you said, the reason this, I brought this up is because you said you're conclusion has been that the women who are defending the indefensible, which would be, let's say, the male claim that femininity, femalehood, is merely subjective identification, that women are claiming to support that because they want to obtain currency. Okay, so why have you become convinced of that, and what exactly do you mean by that? I I just think it becomes, I, I guess, status is part of it, but I think... I think everybody does something for self-serving reasons. And I think by a process of elimination, I can't think why, I just can't think why else a woman would do it. And I've thought about it a lot. You know, I've already tried to think, like, what is in it for someone who says, yeah, your 16-year-old daughter can share a space with a man getting undressed. You know, how, how else could it be justified besides some sort of self-serving motive? And I think it just comes to currency that they can... They can maybe pretend that they don't have these feelings, which may just be heaps of cognitive dissonance, but I, I just don't buy it. I think it's dishonest. I don't buy it that somebody who's experienced any female-only space where men have entered, and most of us women have, and what happens in those moments is we breathe quietly, we wait until the threat is gone, and we understand it. Before I can rationalize it, I understand it as a threat. And I just don't buy that other women don't do that. So they must have self-serving motives. You said when we first started our discussion that, you know, several years ago, within the span of a decade, you were a card-carrying member of the Labour Party and that your political ideology was tilting towards the left. And I suppose the 
classic leftist rejoinder to what you just said was that, no, you've just developed an unreasonable prejudice on behalf of, that's directed towards the poor, oppressed, marginalized, trans men, let's say, the men who are claiming to be women, and that all that happened to you was that you reached the limits of your tolerance and that your genuine prejudice was revealed and that you're rationalizing the emergence of that prejudice by gaslighting the women who are genuinely compassionate about the marginalized. And the reason I'm formulating the question like this is because you you were or are, I, I don't know which, um, on the left politically, and the left historically has been... Um, at least in principle, campaigning for the rights and the inclusion of the dispossessed. And so, look, Kelly, I've gone to to Washington several times and talked to Democrats in the House and in the Senate. And I did the same with Robert Kennedy when I interviewed him recently. And I always ask the, the Democrats that I meet the same question, and that is, when does the left go too far? And I... I've never received an answer to that question. No, and they ask me at reverse, and I always say, well, I think they go too far when they push for equity because that's equality of outcome and that's a complete bloody disaster. And their response uniformly is, no, 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 they just mean equality of opportunity, which they most decidedly don't. But you are or are on the left, and, and maybe we can delve into that a little bit, but for some reason you appear to be proclaiming and do believe that there's something false about the compassion that's being manifested, at least in this particular case. What is that? What, how do you square that with your original leftist presuppositions? And how do you distinguish genuine compassion for the marginalized and, and oppressed from whatever it is that you're objecting to now? Well, I think I had a a journey, shall we say, in this X-Factor world in which we live, um, where I realized that I was being lied to about this. And then I realized that what underpinned it was a a total hatred and dismissive um, attitudes towards women and our fears and the reality of our lives. Um, And, you know, wider and potentially more important, but for me, I'm a women's rights campaigner, but also a disregard of the truth. Um, in favour of a point of view, an ideology, some sort of power um, that's handed over to these people. So it was at that moment that I then have to really question, because I'd be a fool if not to, why else do I believe the things I believe? And are they true? Do they really exist? And the answer I came up with was categorically, no, they're not. Um, Is it true that the left is less misogynist than the right? Absolutely categorically not. Um, the trade union movements, like when you look at those in the UK, they didn't really care about women's workers' rights. And I don't mean gender pay gaps or any ethereal kind of concepts that we can discuss in 2023, whether we agree with them or not. And I think you and I are probably closer to agreeing on that that it doesn't really exist. Um, But yeah, it it just made me think, were the left always like this and I was just stupid and naive or have they really dramatically changed? And I haven't answered that question fully because maybe I just don't want to admit that I've been stupid most of my life. But no, I can't possibly, I don't think, I don't think women right now with this ideology and nobody really standing up for us, I don't think we can place our flag in any political camp. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I worked for a leftist political party when I was a kid. That was a long time ago from the time I was 14 to the time I was 17. And the, I, got to know the wife of the leader of the Socialist Party in my home province of Alberta. And I liked her a lot. She was a librarian from our local junior high school. And uh, me and all the other delinquents used to go out during recess and lunch hour and go hang out in the library and bother Mrs. Notley. And we did that partly because she treated us like adults. And I did it partly because she used to give me things to read. And she gave me a lot of great books to read. And she was the first person who really introduced me to serious literature. And I got to know her and her husband, so that kind of gave me privileged access to the stratospheres of the Labour Party, the Socialist Party, the NDP in Canada. And I met a lot of the leaders, and this was back in 1977, about uh, 77, so a long time ago. And uh, 
You know, I found a lot of them admirable. I thought they were, they were often labor leader types, you know, union types, and they had done a fair bit to give the working class in Canada a voice. And they emerged out of farmers' cooperatives in Saskatchewan, and so that seemed to be like a genuine political movement and a genuine voice for those who were shut out of the political process. The Conservative Party at that time was clearly the party of big business and sort of unashamedly so, and the Liberal Party was in the middle. But the, the NDP, they had admirable people in them, you know, but I watched the activists back then, and they really bothered me. I thought they were resentful and bitter and whiny and narcissistic. And that was eventually why I stopped working with the NDP, and that was in 1979, I guess. So I would say, I don't think the left has always been like this. You know, I, I think that the working class needed a political voice, and I think that's still true. Now, whether they can find it on the left or not now, I, well, I don't think they can. But I don't think that you were merely blind your entire life and that the left has always been pathological. But I do think that compassion is the best camouflage for narcissistic serpents. And so if the left proclaims itself as the party of the oppressed, then it opens up the door to being invaded by those who will use claims of compassion to put forward their narcissistic, what would you, clamoring and groping for power. And one of the problems with being on the left is that it's very hard for liberal types to draw boundaries. And so you risk, you risk being invaded by the real predators. And I, th I really think in some ways that's what's happened to the left is that the narcissists have invaded and they now dominate. And this is an age old story, right? This is, this is a, a danger to, this has been a danger to organizations since, since the dawn of time. And it's certainly happening now. So I don't think it was a complete existential uh, catastrophe, you know, what you believed, but, but I do think that that inability to draw distinctions on the left is, is, is potentially fatal. So where do you find, how do you conceptualize yourself? Now, I, I think I pointed out that if you read your Wikipedia page, then what you are apparently is an anti-transgender rights activist. And that sounds like a pretty damn reprehensible sort of person because, I mean, here's these poor marginalized transgender uh, men, let's say, who are just trying to struggle forward, you know, what would you say, bravely as President Biden would say, and a world hell bent on their oppression and genocide. And there you are, you know, opposing their rights. And so what's your, <laughs> this is a horrible thing to ask, but what's your self-definition? Oh, I struggle with it on a daily basis. It's so fluid. Um, I'm just an adult human female. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm a, a subject of the United Kingdom. I'm just a, a person. But it's just so, I'm just not having it that that um, these men are vulnerable. Like, if you feel vulnerable and you don't want to be, uh, and you you genuinely feel that the world hates you so very much, I don't know why you put on women's clothes to leave the house. I mean, it's just, I'm just not having such a nonsensical, silly uh, ideology taking over what my spaces look like and the spaces of my daughter. So I, I call myself a women's rights activist because I believe that Women's language, I mean, so much uh, goes back to that word woman and what it means and who can use it. Uh, and we are now debating what sex means in the Equality Act, which is just fundamentally just ridiculous. We know what sex means, and now we're having to re-clarify what it means in law um, in our sort of in our rights act so that women can have spaces. And I, for me, the Equality Act is a nonsense anyway. I, I, I digress slightly on this. But for me, the Equality Act is not is, just doesn't make any sense because surely a proportionate reason, and that's one of the things you need to justify a women-only space or a women-only group, is proportionate means. Well, um, if I say I just want women in my group, then that's proportionate. Uh, if I said I just wanted women on my board of a company, maybe not so. But if I say that I just want a social group that's women only for women, um, I don't know why I need to justify keeping a man out who says he's a woman. 
and then it goes back to the GRA, and I'm sure we'll get onto that. But I fundamentally think having a legal fiction in this country is is preposterous and has led to all of the fallout we now see. Um, if we were tolerant, we'd just let these men do what they like, call themselves whatever they like, uh, stay out of women's spaces, and just all get on with our days. But we don't. We have to pretend that they are actually women, and I'm not doing it. So there's a lot of issues that you just brought up there. Yes, yeah, sorry. The, the, well, I would, like, I, I would like, if you would, to explain for those who are watching and listening a little bit more about the Equality Act, and then maybe we could turn to this issue of, I think, I think it's a hatred and jealousy of women. It's a hatred, jealousy, and attraction to what women hypothetically have that's part of the what would you say, nexus of psychopathology that's driving this desire to, to, uh, to tread on the grounds of women's rights, to, to mm. appropriate the domain of femininity. That's a, so yeah. this is cultural appropriation in its most fundamental sense. <laughs> I'd like to delve into that a little bit because, you know, I watched Dylan Mulvaney very carefully. And Dylan Mulvaney makes quite an effective comedian. You know, he's, he's good at parodying women in the same way in a, a manner that's akin to what the Monty Python folks used to do, although because they were, they were you know, very masculine-looking men, they had to parody, they made themselves into particularly hideous middle-aged women and parodied them. And they were very funny about it. And Dylan Mulvaney is actually quite funny, except that he doesn't know when to stop telling the joke. You know, and there is this element of parody in his behavior that's absolutely paramount. When I first saw him, I thought, there is absolutely no way this guy is serious. He's trolling everyone. He's just, this is just a very elaborate joke. And I thought maybe it had a touch of genius in it because it was an incredibly elaborate joke. But, you know, he he's taken the joke a little too far. And it, it seems to me to be quite clear that he will shred his connection with reality to elevate himself narcissistically in the public eye. And, and that means that he's gone too far. And the people who enable him who are these, what would you say, narcissists of compassion on the left, are doing him absolutely no favors. Because I can't see a good end for Dylan Mulvaney. I, I, I can't see how you can go where he's, where he's gone and, and continue. Anyways, let's start with the Equality Act. Will you bring everybody watching and listening up to speed about that? So there are different characteristics. Might be disability, religion, freedom of religion and freedom from religion, um, uh, sexual orientation, gender assignment. So when that started, that used to be, oh, oh, sorry, gender reassignment. So that would that used to be transsexuals. And what they did is they made it so vague and opaque that they could revise what gender reassignment actually meant. So you could be protected. Uh, to what extent? I, I'm not actually sure, but you can't be discriminated against for having gender reassignment. Well, I think there are element, there are points at which it would be inappropriate. For example, um, we do have bra fitters in the UK who now have got jobs. So men who don't have much surgery, who call themselves women, now are bra fitters in in large shops. So, um, so anyway, and you're skeptical this- of that, I take it. <laughs> There's no way, well, look, I'm I'm a prude British, so there's very few uh chances I would take to go and get a bra fitting anyway. But certainly if it was a if it was a, a man, I a person I would call a man, i.e. an actual man, um, then I wouldn't do it. And also I've been, you know, I've got a teenage daughter. You go for a first bra fitting, it's incredibly embarrassing. And to hear a male voice in that space would be horrendous because as we know girls when they develop through puberty it's the most embarrassing time and also the time when they most need to fit in with their peers and so those two things are really hideous anyway um but uh, anyway i digress so the, the equality act is a balance of uh different rights based upon different characteristics um and at the moment in the in the um westminster hall debate yesterday uh, there was a debate on whether or not the Equality Act, when it talks about sex, even though we've got gender reassignment in the Equality Act, now sex is supposed to, according to people mainly on the left, include men who call themselves women, which then makes the whole thing pretty damn laughable if sex in our law, in our legal system, actually means someone who says they're a, a particular sex as opposed to someone who is. 
a particular sex. And I, I just, I just think this is where we are. We have a gen, for example, we have a gender recognition um, act, which means that you can change your gender, but there is no such thing as gender throughout most of our laws um, that that actually has any definition. And it's the same in the states. I should imagine it's the same in Canada, where they flooded all of our laws that actually are reliant on biological sex. They flooded with the word gender, so therefore it becomes mixed up, and then you can pretend all along you just meant people who identify as one sex or another. So, you know, for me, the Equality Act is is a little dated now, and I think very confusing anyway, and I think we need to rip it up and start all over again. Okay, so on the, on the bra-fitting question, let's say, <laughs> so why isn't the proper response to your concerns? Well, it's the modern age. Um, we've already dispensed almost all together with men only spaces. Um, it's now time to do the same to female only spaces and maybe the right attitude for you and your daughter is to just get over your prudishness and to accept the fact that people who want to do something, including bra fitting, can do it regardless of their sex or their gender. So why would you, you, you appear to reject that proposition and why, why do you think that, so, Two questions, I guess. Why do you think it's appropriate for you to reject that claim? And and for you and on behalf of your daughter, let's say. And then there's a thornier question underneath that, which is, well, under what conditions is discrimination, which, by the way, used to mean judgment as well as any, any number of other things, what are the situations under which discrimination actually becomes not only appropriate, but, say, ethically mandated? Mm. This is a conversation we haven't had in our culture for. And I would say this is the fault of the left, although the right-wingers have enabled it by being so hapless. Yeah. We haven't had a discussion about what constitutes appropriate discrimination for, you know, since like 1964. It's a very mm. long time. So first of all, why do you think you're justified in your phobia? There we go. Yeah. In your phobia about going to have a bra fitting with a man who claims to be a woman. Well, I think it, I think if society had moved on to a point where women and men weren't uncomfortable uh, naked around each other, if there was no such thing as sexual assault, if there was no such thing as like low level sexual assault, which is voyeurism and indecent exposure, which is an opportunist crime. And we know that most of the people that will do that will be men and most of the victims will be women and children. So I think in, in that regard, if that had changed and that had, that no longer existed, then maybe I would be open to listening. But we know that men and women don't particularly like to be undressed in front of each other. And if you're in the UK, that includes everybody, whatever sex they are. Um, we're relatively prudish. I'm quite happy to be so. But, you know, I just I just think we're, we have naked bodies and we have boundaries around those sort of naked bodies and in situations where women feel more uncomfortable and in a state of undress. And, and I know that boys feel like that too, um, around uh, the opposite sex at certain stages of their lives, if not all of their lives. And so I think um, that's why, I mean, it, we sort of joke about this question, and uh, but we both know that, that that question is asked. It's a, it's a genuine sort of um, question from the left when you, or from trans activists when you speak about this. And my first uh, question used to be, um, does my 11-year-old daughter have the right to be in a female-only space and not see an adult penis. And I would ask that in female-only labor women groups online. And I was told, no, she's transphobic. You're raising a bigot. Why is your daughter staring at genitals? Is she a pervert? You know, and and so I think at that point you realize it's a quasi-religious cult It's and it's dogmatic and it doesn't make any sense and it's indefensible because they don't have arguments. They have mantras. Well, and, and you, you know, that... That's also a good place to observe as well that that issue of currency that you just described also rears its hideous head at that point. It's like it's a competition between the women that you're talking about to see who can virtue signal the loudest about their loving kindness and tolerance. And that becomes monstrous and devouring when taken beyond a certain point. That's certainly what Freud observed, for example, when he wrote extensively about the Oedipal complex. Because what we're seeing in the culture right now is the Oedipal complex gone mad on a scale that would, I'm sure, is making Freud rotate in his coffin at about 150, you know, 150 spins per second. No one could have possibly envisioned that this, that this onslaught of tyrannical compassion would devour the whole culture. You know, 
It's what would you say the onset of a new kind of totalitarianism that's predicated in a in an antisocial feminine ethos. So so here's some things that 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 you might find interesting. So of course girls hit puberty earlier than boys, and so and it's in some ways more dramatic. And I would say it's more dramatic because women are clearly more vulnerable on the sexual front, and the reason they're more vulnerable is manifold. First of all, they're physically smaller, and so that's a problem. And second, um, if smaller and weaker, especially in the upper body, right? So they're not that good at fending off like full-scale physical assaults, let's say, from a large man. And second, they're sexually vulnerable because a sexual mishap for a woman can result in pregnancy, obviously, and the dangers that are associated with that, and social shame that's associated with uh, inadvertent pregnancy, and then that lengthy period of dependence that's associated with the child, and those are all real costs. And so what happens biologically to girls is that when they hit puberty, two things happen. Their levels of negative emotion increase because there's no difference between negative emotion, baseline negative emotion for boys and girls. But at puberty, the negative emotion of women increases and it never returns to, what would you say, parity with men. It's, it's, it's raised up and it's permanently raised up. This is why women are four to five times more likely, something like that, to suffer from negative emotion-related disorders, uh, including anxiety and depression. And the reason for that, I think, is because if you're vulnerable on the sexual front, which is the case for women, then you should be more sensitive to threat because the world's more dangerous. And now the other thing that happens, so women's anxiety and negative emotion also tends to take the form of bodily self-consciousness. And that's more true for women than for men. And I think it's because the body, that's one way of thinking about it, is the locus of vulnerability for women for the reasons that we just outlined. And it's also because women are evaluated in terms of their status more harshly on the basis of their physical appearance than men are. Now, men are evaluated more harshly on the basis of their, let's say, socioeconomic status, like way more harshly. But so there's some equivalence of harshness, let's say, across the sexes, but it's differentiated. And so your, your, your daughter has every reason to be leery and wary in any situation that she might be exploited. And the reason for that is, well, she might be exploited. And it's not trivial. I mean, I don't think there's any less trivial form of exploitation than exploitation on the sexual front, especially for women. You know, is it, is it, is rape worse than death? Well, it's in, it's arguably worse. No, and it's not taken with requisite seriousness. And so I think you have every leg, you and your daughter have every leg to stand on when you say, well, it isn't obvious to me that it's compassion allowing these unbelievably narcissistic and self-centered men into women's spaces. It's like, what the hell are they doing? If, if a man wants to turn himself into a woman and then just ride off into the sunset and not bother anyone for the rest of his life, it's like, you know, go to hell in the handbasket your own way there, buddy. But when you start proclaiming that you should have access to, let's say, barely pubescent girls and to hell with their feelings because you're all that matters, I think you've gone a little bit too far down the narcissistic path myself. <laughs> yeah. So we've got a number one deluxe meal. Is there anything else I can get you? Yeah, I'd also like a good night's sleep. Excuse me, sir? You know, the I didn't struggle all night with my uncomfortable CPAP mask or something like the my wife didn't kick me out to sleep on the couch because of my constant tossing and turning. Sir, we don't have anything like that here. I think what you're looking for is Inspire. It's an implant that works inside your body to treat sleep apnea without a CPAP. That way you can breathe normally and rest more soundly. Come on! Oh, he sounds angry. Inspire is the only FDA-approved sleep apnea treatment of its kind. It's helping tens of thousands of people finally get restful sleep. To learn more, visit InspireSleep.com. That's InspireSleep.com. Inspire, sleep apnea innovation. Inspire is not for everyone. Talk to your doctor to see if it's right for you and review important safety information at inspiresleep.com. Well, we've always had terrible people, right? People have always existed that want to do bad things and, and want to impose themselves on others. Um, we just now have a state-sanctioned, like, 
narcissist's charter, where it means that those men can can go into women's spaces and celebrated for doing so because they're so stunning and brave for getting undressed in front of teenage girls. It's um, like it's, if it wasn't so serious, it would be amusing that it, it just doesn't make sense. And coherent adults, like sensible, intelligent ad- adults with sensible jobs will actually talk like this, will say that, that what's the harm of a, of a you man? Mean, you mean like the President of the United States? <laughs> I presume you've been watching what happened uh, re- in the last week, which, which again falls under that, that, uh, that heading of, if it wasn't true and dangerous, it would be so funny that it's unbearable category. And so the, the White House invited this, you know, absolutely narcissistic exhibitionist trans, I never know, trans man, trans woman, I can never get the damn terminology right. A man who's deluded himself into, into believing that he's a woman and who's insisting that everyone else participate in his lie. How about that? And what did he do? He stood up on the White House lawn with one of his idiot friends who had had a double mastectomy and she showed off the remnants of her chest proudly and he showed off his silicon breasts. And, you know, that was pretty damn comical given that it was the White House. But what was even more comical was the White House response because Biden had proclaimed the very same day that there's almost nothing braver than a trans man, which, you know, is really quite the bloody claim. And then claimed retrospectively to be shocked and appalled by the fact that the people celebrated for doing exactly the things they did on the White House law and actually came out and did them. And so, yeah, it's an evil parody, you know, and I think there is an evil parody element to, to totalitarianism that, that needs to be called out and noted because everybody in a totalitarian system is an evil clown playing this demented game that's a parody of real life. And there is an element of unbelievably black humor in it. And I see that in the behavior of people like Dylan Mulvaney, right? Because he's obviously parodying women. And I think he does it because he's insanely jealous of what he thinks they have, right? It's the unearned privilege of being a woman, to be elevated onto a kind of pedestal and to and to what? To have the world at your feet because of what? Your beauty? Because that seems to be what he's chasing. And, and all the rights and privileges you accrue, accrue me, merely because you're feminine. And so it's the deluded vision of resentful men who think that those of the opposite sex have an elevated position in creation, right? Have all the rights and none of the responsibilities, have all the beauty and none of the ugliness, and they're jealous of that, and they can't have it. And as a consequence of that, I think they hate women. Yeah. Oh, I something I, I, like I, that. Yeah. I definitely think they hate women. I wonder with D- Dylan whether or not this is not just a vehicle for narcissism, as opposed to I wonder if the, the rest of it is a bit of a sideshow for him, uh, being feminine, being jealous of women. Um, you know, he said some pretty dreadful things, but I wonder if he just hated women always, and this, you know, this just happens to to coincide. But I, I think he's driven by extreme narcissism and wanting to be famous, probably more than he's driven by wanting to be a woman, which I, I don't actually think he does. I think yeah, it's I just think, I think Well, I think that's right. Although I also think watching him, like he is very feminine in his mannerisms. And mm. this is where the distinction between sex and gender becomes complex, right? Because I don't believe that there's any such thing as gender. I think, Me too. I, I think the people who came up with the notion of gender to call them uh, appallingly underqualified and incoherent academics is to say almost nothing about how unqualified and incoherent they are. However, people do vary temperamentally, and there is a relatively large proportion of men, let's say, who have temperaments that on average are more like female temperaments than male temperaments. And the reverse is also true because there's wide temperamental variability among human beings. And so there are lots of feminine men and masculine women. Now, that doesn't mean they're born in the wrong damn body. It just means that the range of temperament within the sexes is actually quite broad. And I think Dylan is a relatively feminine in his temperament. And I think that probably is confusing for him, especially because he's also very high in openness, which is creativity dimension, right? I mean, he's been an actor forever and he still is one. And actors and creative people do have relatively fluid identities because 
being creative and having a fluid identity are the same thing. Now, if you combine that with his narcissism, which is that desire for fame, that untrammeled and, and what would you call it? It's viciously unidimensional de desire for fame. You do get the kind of behavior that he's manifesting, which is like he, it looks like he'll sacrifice himself on the altar of his own fame. And, but that's that's also not that uncommon. It's certainly what school shooters do, for example, right? Is they'll they'll commit suicide to to get a front page headline, and you know that's that's deeply rooted in the motivational structure of men, because of course men are judged on the basis of their social status, and so they're highly motivated to attain that status, you know, by fair means or foul, come come hell or high water. No, I just wanted to make a comment about femininity because I find it really interesting when men are accused, if you like, of being feminine. Because I think so-called effeminate men take up a lot of space, a lot of public space. And I don't mean like man-spreading. I mean, like literally volume-wise, um, what they're willing to do, how they enter a room. It doesn't strike me as particularly feminine if we look at stereotypical feminine, which is make make yourself small, stay quiet, be submissive. I don't think flamboyant, effeminate men are remotely feminine. I don't know what else to call it. Certainly not masculine, but it is. It just doesn't seem to, for me, neatly fit into what is feminine. Um, but. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think mean, maybe there's that's that's a good that's a good distinction. Well, I think archetypally there's sort of two classes of feminine, right? You could think about it as the virgin and the whore, and so and and there's an uneasy tension between those two, obviously, and the kind of feminine behavior that you're claiming to be not feminine is more on the whore side of things, and it's histrionic and demonstrative, and. You know, you can see elements of it. You know, you can see elements of that in the uh, in the icons that gay men, for example, choose to idolize on the feminine side. You know, and they would be they would be people like Marilyn Monroe, for example, who's an icon among the gay community, and that's because her femininity is. And like, I, I don't want to be unfair to Marilyn Monroe because that's that's not my point, but she's. Her persona was very glamorous and demonstrative. And when that gets pathologized, the psychiatric community, the psychological community describes that as histrionic. And it's certainly the case that the behavior, and that's from hysteria, by the way, which meant wandering womb and wandering uterus to begin with. And back in the dark Victorian times, sometimes histrionic women were cured by, um, by uh, hysterectomy which cured their hysteria, right? So that's all interestingly and bizarrely intertwined. But the femininity that the men that you're describing flaunt isn't the reserved, chaste end of the femininity distribution. It's the more histrionic, demonstrative, attention-seeking, femme fatale end of the distribution. Like your typical trans man like Dylan dresses up like a movie star, not like, you know, not like a nun, unless he's parodying nuns. Yes, he does. Yeah, you're right. So let's talk about what happened to you in your public speeches. So what are you, what are you, what is it that you're, what are you trying to accomplish with your public, um, your public communications? And let's, would you tell a few stories about what's happened to you? So for example, <laughs> what happened to you in New Zealand became worldwide news. Um, if you'd like, we could start with that, or maybe you could Maybe you could trace the development of your of your public speaking. So that this must have all come as somewhat of a shock to you and, and produced a lot of changes in your life. Maybe we'll do it that way. When okay. did you start speaking publicly? So after the billboard uh, got taken down, um, I was sort of my banning from this public square, the modern public square, i.e. Twitter, Facebook, etc. That began. So I was banned from Twitter for nearly five years. So my voice in the public square just disappeared. I'm I'm not even allowed to sign a petition on change.org. Like I'm I'm so banned. <laughs> um uh, people won't make things for me. Anyway, so I was banned from everywhere. So I was like, well, let's go back to the actual public square um and make real life connections with people. And so I started doing that in about 2019. Uh and we started doing speeches at Speakers Corner and inviting women to come and speak. 
And then women all over the country uh, couldn't get to those events. Um, I also did one in lockdown. Um, so we did a speed. We did. We went to Leeds, which is in the north of England during lockdown. But because we weren't marching about uh, Black Lives Matter, we could catch COVID. So we all got arrested for trying to speak oh, yes. in the public. <laughs> and then I was at a cell that was covered in sort of body fluids. Um, so I think I was more at risk of catching COVID in that cell, but I got arrested live uh, on my live stream. <clears throat> but it, it's just about, it's twofold, or it, maybe more than that. Uh, there's One, it means that women get to speak in public about the, their fears uh, of for their children, for the education system, for the state, um, specifically to do with this quasi-religious cult of transgenderism. So that will be one element of it. So free speech is a really important part of that. Enabling women to come along who don't have to buy a ticket to watch a few special women on a platform and on a panel speak about their lives, but ordinary women speaking about their lives. And we live stream it, which means other women, maybe in very similar situations, will hear their story and it will resonate. And it's about waking everybody up to what the dangers are of this cult. Um, and the other thing is that we we basically, through, through bait and perfect fishing uh, conditions, we bring out the misogyny and we, we conjure, <laughs> we basically play the opposition um, who come along and object violently and aggressively to women speaking in public. And so then we show everybody just exactly what's going on. So you started that at Speaker's Corner, and you, yeah. you've traveled around the world now holding these events. What, what countries yeah. have you gone to? Well, we did the U.S., so I did about 10 dates in the U.S. I couldn't go to Portland. You won't be surprised because there were incredible death threats in Portland, so we didn't go there. Um, we went to San Francisco. Um, I uh, objected to a senator who brought in the bill, SB 132, which is about men and women's Was that presence. Scott, Scott Weiner? Yes, it was. What a... Oh he's yeah, he's real named, fun. Man, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so, um, Chicago, um, and I made a documentary about it. Uh, and what what I learned in America is you may have the right um, to free speech, but you do not have the right to be heard. So we got protested um, as long as people didn't touch our faces or touch us um, in front of the police. They were allowed to just be this close to our faces, banging making noise so we couldn't be heard. So that was very interesting. Um, and then I thought, well, I'll go to Australia and New Zealand. They're relatively lovely places to visit. And I went to Australia and I got defamed by one of the politicians who read my Wikipedia page, didn't fact check a single word of it and <laughs> put it out on the television, which then made my life very vulnerable. And I went to New Zealand and I was mobbed um, by the estimate is about sort of three to 5,000 people who who really did want something terrible happen, to happen to me. Um, and I did, That's I a lot of people in New that. Zealand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's nearly half the country, I'm told. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so they they came to, to protest and, and it was very aggressive. And then I had to go into police protection until I could leave the country. And in, even in the police station, it was only on a need-to-know basis. So even police officers didn't know I was in the police station to keep me safe. What was that like for you in New Zealand? I mean, I watched the footage and it was quite, it was quite the show. I mean, what did that do to you and, and why haven't you stopped? I mean, you could just go back to your life in principle. Maybe you can't. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're too far into this now so that, you know, your life will never be what it was. That's possible. But in principle, you could stop saying the things that you're saying and you could stop exposing yourself to this pretty high level of public threat. I mean, yeah. I've been in nasty, nasty demonstrations and they're not exactly fun, especially when people are, you know, six inches from your face and screaming mm -hmm. madly away. And like, I'm always afraid I'm going to do something that I would regret in a situation like that. I mean, I have security people, and part of the reason for that is so they don't let me do anything I'll regret when <laughs> someone is screaming madly six inches from my face yeah. or using an air horn, you know, to shut me down, but really so that their sadistic, the little sadistic devil that they've allowed to dwell inside them can, what would you say, delight in the fact that they're <clears throat> potentially deafening someone. And that's happened multiple times. But I mean, that was a lot of people who were after you. And 
that was a pretty tense situation to say the least. And so what did that do to you psychologically? And why are you continuing to, to, to speak out, let's say? I don't know. Maybe I'm a sociopath because it didn't actually, you know, people say, how are you recovering? Are, are you okay? And I, in those moments, I just put one foot in front of the other. I think you do when you're in moments like that. You you focus on the things that you can control. And for me, it was about stepping forward and not letting anybody fall over. So not letting the person in front of me when there was a bench coming up fall over the bench because I just felt that we would we would be stomped and probably killed if we hit the floor. Um, but I say a lot on my channel, like, if not, if not you, then who? And it's me. Um, you know, in this entire movement, um, to be rather immodest, I, I probably am the most known um, female uh, in this women's rights movement, not in the sort of the broader free speech movement, but in this women's rights movement. And I am really lucky. I don't have an employer. Um, I'm self-funded. I sell merchandise in order to, for me to do these things. I now need um, to sort of very expensive security um, whenever I go and do a public event because I can't be certain that I'm going to be okay. Um, and we have sort of exit strategies and plans. But yeah, I just, I, you know, there's a bit of me that thinks, how, how dare they? Like, who do they think they are? I'm, why would I stop? Like, there's, there's, women, there's girls in the United States of America, age 13, having their breasts removed, probably dozens today. Like, why would I stop? It's, I'm... I'm an atheist, but I would say that if anything was going to convince me that there was a devil, it would be this. It's just plain evil. Yeah, well, lots of people, lots of people come to God through contact with the devil. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, is once you have encountered malevolence, you start to understand the reality of evil. And once you start to understand the reality of evil, you're compelled by logical necessity to posit the reality of good. You know, and God has been defined for a very long time as the pinnacle of what constitutes good. And if you start to believe in radical evil, well, you start to have to posit that its opposite exists, right? And so that's an interesting, you might say that's a very interesting road to walk down. I mean, you're trying to figure out in part, you know, what's your moral obligation under such circumstances? And you alluded to the fact that you think that somebody has to speak for people, let's say, like Chloe Cole, who was, I think she had a double mastectomy when she was 15, and the wounds never healed properly, surprise, surprise, because, you know, it's butchery and not surgery. And But, you know, you, you also alluded to the fact that you think in some ways that it's self-evident that people should stand up against this because, well, look at what's right in front of you, folks, but most people don't. And you're pilloried quite roundly I mean, your Wikipedia page is actually quite a work of art because you definitely come across as quite the reprehensible creature in on that page. And, you know, that's an example of exactly how you're pilloried and painted by the radicals on the left. And, you know, the the one of the interesting issues here is, well, just exactly what it is that, what is it that you're fighting? You know, I read the other day, this is a very interesting paper. There's about 10 papers now that are looking at the, what would you say, the nature and the, the psychological traits uh, associated, the nature of left-wing authoritarianism and the psychological traits that are associated with it. And so some of the latest research shows very clearly that malignant narcissism, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, and sadism are very, very good predictors of left-wing authoritarianism. And left-wing authoritarianism seems to be a pastiche of sort of progressive left-wing political views, which would include the expansion of rights and this kind of compassion that perhaps originally attracted you to the left, you know, years ago, but also the insistence that all of that can be, could and should be imposed by force and, and through the means of compulsion. So it's the ag aggregate of those two things. And the people who hold those viewpoints are remarkably disproportionately likely to be sadistic, psychopathic, Machiavellian narcissists. And so, you know, you might ask yourself, well, are you engaged in a political fight or are you just engaged in the age-old, what would you say, 
requirement of women to put the serpent under their heel, right? You know, that's what God calls upon women to do at the end of the story, the Adam and Eve story in Genesis, right? Is to, to bruise the head of the serpent with your heel. There's this great image of Mary that's a Renaissance image. It was very common Renaissance image, eh? And it's an attempt to lay out the symbolic image of the divine feminine. And so what you see is Mary, who's the mother of the Savior, the eternal mother of the Savior, the mother of the hero, let's say. And she has uh, like a crown of stars, 12 stars around her head. And that means that her head is in the stars. And her foot is on the head of a serpent. Very common motif. And what that does mean is that if you aim for the highest aim possible, you will simultaneously put your foot on the head of the serpent. And that that's actually your, what would you say, that's your divine obligation as a female. You know, that, and women, of course, forever have protected the vulnerable from the real serpents. You know, and in our mammalian heritage, going back 60 million years, that often meant, what would you say, doing everything possible to stop your children from being eaten, right? Well, there's, there's being eaten in the real world, concretely, as a consequence of exposure to genuine predators, reptiles and otherwise, but there's also all sorts of being eaten that your children can face on the abstract front. And so, well, these are all, what would you say, religious ideas lurking beneath the surface of this strange political situation that we find ourselves in. So you feel a moral obligation to do this. And tell me again when that started to emerge. In 2015, when we elected a conservative government, because I, I, I don't think many of us, because I was in the left, so I had no idea what was going on outside. Uh, and I didn't know that we were going to elect a conservative government, and we did. And so it, 2015, and then, you know, I, I wrote a, a letter called Grieving the Left when I was in 2016 about, you know, I just, I couldn't tolerate being part of something and even now, women that are on the left trying to fight this from inside, um, they still haven't gone on that sort of discovery of what else am I, what else is wrong with my assumptions. So I think that's, um, you know, I, I think about Chloe Cole uh, and and girls like her, and I think overwhelmingly the thing I I think is the greatest harm is that. They have themselves to blame. Now, I don't really think they do because they're children and they can't consent. And normally in situations, we would say that children aren't to blame for things that happen to them, like the medical mutilation of their bodies. But she must have to wrestle with that. They all must when they come to the decision that what they've, what they've done to themselves is wrong. And they must definitely wear some of that blame. And I just can't... Well, if you're... I, if you're a lying therapist, let's say, and your goal as a lying therapist is to elevate your own moral standing in your own eyes, um, even at the cost of your clients, then you enable their darkest motivations. And so, and you do that under the guise of compassion. And so Chloe told me when I interviewed her that when she was starting to go through puberty, she was a real admirer of the Kardashian girl with her, you know, exaggerated, hypersexualized female hourglass figure. And I'm not critiquing that, by the way. I'm saying that Chloe had adopted that as an ideal. And she became convinced, and I don't think she's ever told anyone this. She might have. She certainly didn't tell her demented, idiot, lying therapists who enabled her, her worst impulses. She decided, and this was all part of, you might say, prepubescent fantasy, that she wasn't going to make a very good woman because she realized, rightly or wrongly, when she started to go through puberty, and that happened fairly early, that she was likely to have a comparatively boyish figure. Now, I mean, compared to Kardashian, virtually all women have a boyish figure, so, you know, you could say that her standard of comparison was not precisely wisely chosen, but you could understand why she might have done it. And she decided that, well, she was never going to be a very good woman, so maybe she could, she could do better as a boy. You know, and there's a, 
There's a temptation in that, right? And, and, and that bore, bears on this issue of moral culpability, is she was toying with irresponsible ideas, right? They were dwelling, they were, they were attempting to dwell within her. That's a good way of thinking about it. Now, a good therapist would have listened to her so hard that he would have elicited that realm of fantasy, let's say, and then walked her through it. You know, because the right discussion is, well, why did you pick Kardashian as your as your target for femininity? And isn't it the case that there are an immense variety of female forms of beauty? Like Audrey Hepburn wasn't Kardashian. You know, she looked, she had that gammon, I think that's what they call it, look, which is more waif-like and, and in some ways more boyish. And there was no reason for Chloe to assume that the only acceptable female adult human female form was that exaggerated uh hourglass femininity characterized by Kardashian, and that should have been delved into. And But she got her, to call her psychological care poor is to give far more credit to her therapists than they deserve, because not only was it poor, it was, it was the reverse of helpful. You know, and so she was enticed down the garden path by her own fantasies, but still more fundamentally, she was enabled by the liars and the butchers that she ran into. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's unfathomable. I mean, if we really, if we think about a hospital in America right now, um, you know, sedating somebody, getting ready for a double mastectomy in their teens, it's it's just, it's difficult to think that why I, I, I just can't, I can't leave it. Like, I can't stop until it stops because um, I've got four children. I want them to live in a world where they can speak. Like my one of my sons is at university. I can't even drop him off. Like he, nobody can know that I'm his mother. You know, it's um, I don't want my kids to live in that world where they should be able to talk about everything, even really terrible ideas. They should be able to express um, in a in public or to their friends, and uh, they can't do that. So I do, I just think it it's yeah nothing would persuade me. I don't think to to stop because the more people try to stop me the more i think i'm i'm right and i'm on the right path and it has to be done mm -hmm. yeah well that's a good that's a good uk tradition you know that's for sure what do your kids think about you and what you're doing well they're all quite lovely actually even if i do say so myself so i have four children i have a 21 year old boy 20 year old boy 16 year old girl and a 14 year old boy um my 14-year-old is the most likely to try and engage in the topic with his friends, which has not been very successful. Um, my daughter said to me quite some years ago, Mummy, I think you'll be in the history book. So she's on side. They all, they all think I'm right. I'm very lucky. I've known about this since 2015 and before it was really poisoned uh, all the way through the school. So uh, I had a really good chance and we're quite open, you know, in my house. And I don't mean like we sit around saying singing kumbaya i mean that if my kids had an issue they can come to me and talk about stuff so yeah okay so so you said it's partly because you're open and in your communication style but it seems to be likely from what you've just said that they must trust you i mean th this must have been quite troublesome for them to see all this happening around you and so why do you think you've been fortunate enough to continue to have that familial support i mean these issues sometimes break families up so what, why hasn't that happened in your case? Well, I think because I'm a parent and I've parented my children. I think there's a, you know, women come to my meetings where their children can't be told that they're there because their children might fall out with them. And I just think, no, I'm the role of the parent in my children's lives. I'm not their friend. Uh, they don't have to agree with me. I don't have to agree with them. It's not like they have to think every everything that comes out of my mouth is right. But... I am their parent. And so they trust me because throughout their lives, when I've said something, I'm telling the truth um, in an age-appropriate way. And so I think they understand that my sort of, I don't know if I'm an authoritarian, although I'm, I'm relatively close, I suspect, uh, when it comes to my parenting. But, you know, I'm, they, if I say that something is okay, that I'm going to be fine, that I'll do it and it will be done. They've seen time and time again that that happens. Um, one of my children um, in their school, they they were going to have a lobby group go in and give a presentation about gender identity. So I I said to my son, well, I'll, I'll go and sort this out. 
And I went into the school and I had a meeting with the head of uh, PSHE and I, she said, oh, well, we don't really know what we're teaching. So we've got this lobby group in. And I said, who? Oh, well, she said an education group, but they're not. They're, they're a lobby group. They're a pro-trans lobby group that are trying to indoctrinate children in schools. And she said, um, oh, it's Gyres. And I said, oh, no, you won't. No. And um, she said, oh, any reason? I said, no, you won't be doing that because it's harmful to children. And if you don't know what you're teaching, why would you let someone else teach it? No, that, that will not happen. Um, and I think I have enough authority in my voice. And it did not happen because I said it wouldn't happen. And my kids know that if, if I do that, it happens. I could put your mind at ease on one front, perhaps. So there are a variety of different parenting styles, and um, one of them is authoritarian, but the other, the opposite of that is, I don't remember the technical term, but it, it's basically, it's basically lax and progressive, but what it really is, is irresponsible in the guise of inclusivity and compassion. And then in the middle, there's authoritative, right? And kids with authoritative parents do better. I'll be that one then. So, well, right, right. Well, that's not the same as authoritarian. And it's really useful to know this, especially for people on the left, because people on the left tend to think that anything authoritative is authoritarian. And that's just not true, right? And you're, well, I would say um, that's partly what you've been clarifying for yourself conceptually as you've wrestled with the, what would you say, the problematic elements of your your previous, your previous leftist stance, right? Where do you draw the line? Well, authoritative, authoritative people draw the line. And when you draw the line, what you mean when you draw the line is, no, you're not going to do that. And no means something like, if you continue to do that, something you do not like will, will happen to you with 100% um, well, certainty. That's what no means, you know, and there's a certain harshness in that. And if that's applied all the time, well, then it becomes authoritarian, obviously, because authoritarians say no to everything. But people who are judicious say no to the things that should be, should, that should have no said to them. And that is very, what would you say? It's, it's anxiety relieving for children, eh? Because children want to know where the walls are because they want to know in what space they can play and what's there to keep the predators at bay. And so they push and push their parents and everyone around them to find out where the walls are. If you're asking, you know, why do children misbehave and test the limits is because one, if they find limits, then they can relax comfortably within them. People do that in the context of their romantic relationships all the time too. They provoke to see where the walls are. And if the answer is, well, there are no walls anywhere, then the upshot of that is that you're exposed to everything in the world and you're terrified. And so the progressive parents terrify their children because there are no boundaries. And so then their children just explode in every direction, testing the limits, praying desperately to themselves that they'll find them somewhere. And the progressive types say, well, you know, there are no limits because all limits are nothing but authority. And their children are, are desperate and, and lost. Yeah, well... Oh, that's not much fun, that's for sure. So, so would you tell me a little bit about, about mermaids? Because people in North America don't know very much about that story, and you've had some entanglements with that particularly lovely organization. So I've been interviewed under caution by the British police uh, on two occasions at the behest of mermaids. So mermaids is a charity in the UK. Um, I would class them as a pro trans in kids lobby group um, who claims to uh, protect trans kids, which I think is a, is a nonsensical uh, thing that doesn't exist. Uh, there is no such thing as a trans child, just like there's no such thing as a vegan cat. Um, and you have Susie Green, when her son was 12, she took him out of the country to see Dr. I think his name's Dr. Quack. Um, it might not be, but I've remembered it like that. And I You think just want it to be. <laughs> it might actually be Dr. Oh, no, it's SPAC, but I've remembered it as Dr. Quack. I just put it in my memory bank. <laughs> so sorry. 
Anyway, she took him and got puberty blockers. We didn't give them out in the country back then. Um, and then at 16, she took him to Thailand and had uh, his testicles removed, which I called castrated on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and I got... Which is what it is, by the way. Yeah. Although in my, in my police interview, which I did no comment all the way through, but in the interview, the hate crime officer, which is an actual thing in the UK, the hate crime officer said, did you know sex reassignment surgery doesn't include castration? And I wasn't allowed to say anything, but I just thought, what did he think? That he came home with, what, testicles for earrings? Like, of course it includes castration. Um, but yeah, he was 16. And, and since then in Thailand, they don't do surgeries on children and cut their testicles off and slice and invert their penises into a never healing hole. Um, but yeah, I got in trouble by the British police. Uh, Twitter released my information to the police. And then I was interviewed under caution, and uh, they were going to charge me with... What does that mean? What does it mean to be interviewed under caution? It's kind of like you have the right to remain silent, so it's a, it's recorded, um, and anything you say in that can be used in a court against you, so... I see, I see. You know, they said they said it was voluntary, but if I didn't go to the interview... They, oh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> if I didn't go to the interview, they would... Um, maybe come and arrest me at my house, or if I was pulled over for a traffic offence, they would arrest me, or if I tried to leave the country, they would arrest me. Um, that's I see. So it was voluntary except for the force part. <laughs> yeah, it was voluntary, but yeah, it like, didn't, like there was masks. punishment. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, totally. right. Yeah, yeah, you guys are having a lot of fun in the UK with this whole hate crime officer thing and mm. interviewed under caution. And yeah, and I guess the Irish are running down that road pretty much as fast as they can now putting forward the world's most reprehensible hate speech uh, policy, which so nice. I always think that hate speech policy is inevitably derived by people who hate speech. And so that's <laughs> actually why they, they call it that. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, it, precisely. And so, so what was it like for you to be, to be interviewed by the police in the UK, right? The, the, the home of Liberty Central, you might say, for the world, because I think that's a fair description of the UK. I mean, you people, broadly speaking, brought liberty to the world. That's not a bad way of thinking about it. I mean, you had some help from the Judeo-Christian tradition, that's for sure. But the UK has performed a pretty stellar job on that front. And now here you are with uh, hate crime officers and people like you being interviewed under caution. And so what does that do to you as a UK citizen? Well, at first, for a start, I thought it was a joke because they text me. So I just, I just assumed, <laughs> I didn't know we were so strapped for cash that they would send me a text to ask me to go do an interview. Um, but I think the realization that the police are ideologically captured should, should instill fear into everybody. Um, like whatever that, even if it was an ideology that I agreed with, I think it should still make you afraid because the law should be the law. Um, and it should just be quite cold, black and white, right or wrong. I'm quite happy with those things. Uh, so to know that they've been ide ideologically captured was significant. The fact that they sent officers from the opposite side of the country and they stayed a night in a hotel in order to interview oh, me. Oh, that's interesting. Was so nuts. they didn't use local officers? No, no. And oh this yeah, is, that's sneaky. <laughs> I mean, this is, I've done this three times for, one of them was saying that there was a, uh, so in Brighton last year, I said that a woman uh, who called herself trans man and then non-binary just actually, she'd said disparaging things about lesbians because she wished she could have been one um, and accepted herself. Uh, and I was, I was in front of the police again. That was a, that was police from the opposite side of the country, from Brighton to the West where I live. Um and it's just utterly insane. The other occasion I had police at my door, two police officers, because, and I quote, I had been untoward about paedophiles. And I don't know about you, Jordan, but I thought they were one group of people, if any, <laughs> that you could be untoward about were paedophiles. Oh, yes. Well, not. spoken like a true fascist, you and your prejudice <laughs> against paedophiles. So, yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully you won't. Well, we're probably going to get cancelled on YouTube for this interview anyways, yeah. but now you've made it a virtual certainty. Sorry. You and your prejudice <laughs> against minor attracted persons, let's say. Do you know that 53% of mothers with children who purport to have gender dysphoria have borderline personality disorder or 
something roughly equivalent. You know, and so you could say, as a clinician, if you weren't lying and or compelled to lie by your government, which is by the way now the case for all clinicians, that any that the suspicion properly raised when confronted by any child who has gender dysphoria is that the mother has borderline personality disorder. And borderline personality disorder is a very, very serious disorder. And it's associated with cluster B in the DSM-4. And that's, that's where all the traits like antisocial personality and narcissism and psychopathy and childhood conduct disorder, et cetera, all cluster. And so the mermaid's mother um, you know, she's one to be viewed with suspicion, to say the least, especially given what she did to her son, which to call it reprehensible and inexcusable is to, is to say that Joseph Mengele was not a very nice boy. And, and she, it's very interesting to see that you're in a situation in the UK where someone who's as bent and twisted as that can operate an entire charity and wield social influence and also set up circumstances so that someone like you can be persecuted by the police. Yeah. That's quite the inversion. See, this doesn't seem to me to be political anymore when it comes to that. It's something far darker than the mere political. And I don't know, what do you think about that? You said that you're not religious, that you're atheistic, but you, you understand that there's a strange sort of battle going on. And do you still construe it fundamentally in political terms, that, that it's a battle between, say, belief systems? Or how do you, how do you conceptualize the war that you find yourself in? I think my view on it is instinctive and perhaps I'm quite lucky that I don't try and rationalize my instincts. I just go with them. Uh, it's always kept me pretty safe. And that's what I talk to my children about. That's like one of the big lessons is if it feels wrong, it's wrong. And, and if you're, if actually it was a safe situation that you left, there's no harm. Um, but, you know, trust your instincts. Uh, I think it's, I think a lot has happened in order to get to this point. I think one of the biggest things as I move through this movement is the lack of community. And I wonder if if we didn't all move so far away from our natural communities, um, I wonder if people would get away with this stuff because we would have a broad range of people in our lives of all different ages uh, that would be talking to us all the time and we would get a, a wide sort of plethora of views on any given anything. And I think we'd learn actually that human behavior is pretty standard, whether you are in the 1400s, the 1800s, or right now. I think our impulses and urges are pretty similar. If, if not the society in which we live, maybe we don't exercise them in the same way or express them in the same way. But I think that we are we are as old as time and, and I don't think we, we change that much. Um, but I think think it just goes down to currency again. And I think um, borderline personality disorder or not, uh, and I'm inclined to agree with you, but women women get sort of social kudos from transitioning their kids. I mean, I always say to people, you know, if, if somebody said, oh, I live next door to John, he's a racist, you should, he's, nobody would say, oh, that's great. Well done, you must be so lucky. But if someone said, oh, I live, live next door to someone, She's got a beautiful trans son. Um, people are then engaged in this nonsensical kind of, wow, that's so great. Um, and I say to people all the time, you should say, oh, gosh, that's awful. That poor kid. You know, that's what you should be saying, that poor kid, because we know. So apparently, the, apparently the actress Megan Fox has three boys who are all trans. I'm so shocked because she seems such a, yeah. such a resolute, sensible woman. Yeah, well, the I think the the odds of that I think are one in twenty seven million. Because you, the odds of having one trans kid, this is before all this blew up and became you know a statistical morass. Because you can't really estimate the prevalence accuracy anymore, of course, because it's become a social contagion. But originally, the estimates were something like one in three thousand, and I think that was probably an overestimate. But whatever, it's close enough, and so the probability you'll have two trans kids is one in nine million, and the probability that you'll have three is one in 27 million. So you think, well, the odds that the mother is a, what would you say, a narcissist willing to sacrifice her children to Moloch for the elevation of her own moral stature is 26,999,999 to one. 
So, but then you've you got know, Jazz Jennings, that... haven't you? You've got Jazz Jennings yeah, yeah. Like, having a whole program about, about him and his distress. I mean, if that isn't an advertisement for do not do anything to your kids, I don't know what is. It's Yeah, well, scary. the question is, what has that been an advertisement for? I mean, when someone like you watches that program, you think, oh my God, there's a little, uh, what you say, window into the abysmal. But I would say, in all probability, that that has the fundamental consequence of that show has been that a whole parade of currency-seeking, virtue-signaling, narcissistic, compassionate mothers have figured out a great way to exploit their right. children to gain social currency. Yeah. I mean, because for they Paris, don't care. Yeah. Right? For Paris Hilton and Kim Kardashian, they just, they, they just made a sex tape. Um, they haven't sacrificed mm -hmm. their kids. You know, maybe... Maybe mothers should be encouraged to do that instead. I am joking. I'm being facetious, but it's like, I don't know why. See, you're on I don't Dante know why territory they're given... there, right? You're <laughs> on Dante territory, <laughs> trying, to, trying to organize out the different levels of hell, right? Well, I think, we're, I think we are in, we are kind of in one, in a country, you know, in both of our, well, in Canada, in America, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, where actually there is, there is a, a churning through of children into this cult. I think it's it's a certain level of hell all of, all of its own. And the fact that you can't yeah, well, in Canada, to... we pride ourselves we pride ourselves in Canada on being on the cutting edge of that particular bit of butchery, <laughs> so to speak. And you know, our prime minister, he's like virtue signaling king of the universe. And one of the things that's really appalling about that is that he really does have Canadian women fooled. You know, and it's really something to watch because most Canadian women still think that Justin Trudeau is the right leader for the times. And it's because he's got that superficial charm and grace that goes along with his consummate acting ability. And he can use compassion to guise his true nature like nobody's business. And so Canada is in rough shape in consequence on all sorts of fronts. And, you know, thank God we, we lost Jacinda Ardern and also Nicola Sturgeon. She was a really interesting example to me, you know. I, th I thought it was so fascinating to see because she really fell into the leftist abyss in, in a most profound way because her stance was, well, of course, any man who says he's a woman is a woman. And the right rejoinder to that was the one that the journalist who really nailed her uh, provided, which was every man, eh? Every one, eh? How about the psychopathic serial sex offenders? How about them? Well, of course, they're women too. It's like, okay, fair enough. Let's play that out and see how it goes, right? Trans men, trans women, whatever the hell they are, demented men who claim to be women so that they can get access to women, you're going to feel sorry for them. That's your, that's your doctrine on the political front. You know, that pretty much did Nicola Sturgeon in and it was well-deserved. Kelly, what do you want? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Like if you look five years down the road and you're successful in whatever it is that you're doing, what does success look like to you? I think it looks like a repealing of the GRA, so there's no more legal fiction. The GRA is a Gender Recognition Act in which men or women can pretend that they're the opposite sex and be legally recognized. I think if we if we take that away, I think we begin to get this out of our institutions. I'd like to I'd like women to be able to go to a hospital and if they ask for a female member of staff, that that's what's delivered. Um, here at Standing for Women, uh, with my organisation, we did some research and only four out of all NHS trusts in the UK, which are plentiful, so every single area has a different NHS trust, um, they only recognise 4%, I think it was, or four out of all of them recognised a man who called himself a woman as a different thing to an actual woman. So what that would mean, for example, um, there is an acute uh, mental health ward for women in a hospital, I think it's in Sussex, and the head nurse there is a man who wears fetish nurse gear for kicks outside of the hospital. He now calls himself a woman, and the first thing he did as the head nurse of this acute psychiatric ward for women, who clearly have been through probably, uh, you know, a good 50% maybe uh, trauma at the hands of men and male violence, um, he moved his office down to where these women sleep. And he was celebrated for that. So I want women oh, to go to Oh, that's fun. That's, that's great. That's, that's one of the most demented stories I've ever heard. So thank you for I know. I'll send you, you some full details. Thank you for offering that to everyone. You. 
Please <laughs> you do. You can have a look at the photos. It's, I just don't think I could make up some of the things that I know that are happening. I know, I know se- senior police officers who are autogynophiles who um, yeah. make excuses to go and speak to female victims of crime where they normally wouldn't because they're far wow. too senior. Right? So this is, once you can lie to people and say a woman has a penis or a baby has a sexuality, once you can tell these massive lies and people go along with it, they're susceptible to go along with pretty much anything. That's, yeah, that, you really put your finger on it there. That's, I think that's exactly right. If you can force people to swallow the insistence that a man is a woman, then you've blown out the law of non-contradiction completely, and you are now allowed not only to say any damn thing you want, but to insist that everybody abide by it like it's the dictates of God himself. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. Yeah. It's quite the trick. It's quite the trick. They must not question it. I mean, we we know. I did theology as a degree. Uh, it's a very long story, but I am a gold star atheist, so I've never had belief in God at all. I was brought up in an atheist household with a, a relapsed Catholic mother, um, but. I, I, there's, there's just, there's something so religious about it in the, the sort of dogmatic way that you cannot question it at all. It is like a, it's, it's like a religion from like the, the 1500s. It's, it's so insane. Well, I, 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 the, the thing that frightens me, I'm afraid, is that there, there are no non-religious beliefs that, not in the final analysis. And if the, religious belief that properly unifies people is sacrifice. This is sort of the Nietzschean observation about the death of God. What you see is, you don't even see the rise of new religions, Kelly, I don't think. What you see is a regression to archaic forms of religious belief, and that's essentially a polytheistic paganism. And so, you know, it's interesting to talk to you because it looks to me like you're someone who's come to believe in the devil but not in God. And I did make allusion to that earlier. And I'm not, I'm not, by the way, rendering judgment on that one way or another. But you're also seeing that there is a religious element to this cult-like move that you're opposing. And you might ask yourself, and, and I suspect you probably do, is that, well, what's the alternative to that? You know, and what I've seen is that the kind of humanism that's been put forward as a moral alternative by the humanist types, and they're generally atheistic, has proved to be not only a force that's absolutely 100% unable to stop this tide of strange polytheistic paganism, but has actually enabled it. You know, and that does beg the question, well, what do you have as a replacement? Your replacement today was, you know, you rely on your you said on your instincts, you know, and, and your your intrinsic sense of what's right and what's wrong, and you let that guide you. And, you know, that works out pretty well if if you're well constituted and your moral sentiments are properly what functioning properly in the absence of too much delusion. But, you know, it's 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 not a reliable source for people who are unbelievably and deeply confused. And so we're all going to have to contend with the question of what is it that we should believe as an alternative to this strange cult-like narcissistic nonsense that seems to be spread threatening us on all fronts? Mm. So, well, so what's next for you? Sorry, maybe you have some comments about that. Well, I, just, I, I just think about the, the, the religion. I'm, I'm not so stupid and that I don't acknowledge that I was brought up in a country that was religious. Uh, certainly in my formative years. And I, I do think the lack of religion and common purpose and community that I think religion and faith brings, I do think when there is a vacuum created, then we do fill it with some, some pretty terrible things. So I wonder if after all this chaos, people will be looking for a very prescriptive religion. And I, I wonder if Islam will be the thing that slots very happily into that place because it it does give people order. And I, I just think that what comes after no boundaries, and I think people will be looking for really clear, concise boundaries to keep them safe, because we are going to end up in a place where we don't feel very safe, because oh, not even the ground that we stand upon will feel particularly solid. So I am, I've got a lot of very religious friends who tell me that I'm the most Christian <laughs> atheist they've 
they've ever met. <laughs> um, yeah. And I'll, I'll probably end up being some sort of uh, evangelical pastor before my, my days on this earth Probably, are, are yeah. You'll end up canonized. That, that, would be, that would be good revenge on you. That's for sure. That'd be God's little joke for you. Yeah, yeah. So, well, look, we're kind of running out of time here on this okay. front. For everybody watching and listening, I'm going to flip over to the Daily Wire Plus platform and continue to talk to Kelly and get to know her a little bit better, I walk her through her biography so that I can, and everyone listening can understand where she's coming from and why. And so if you'd be inclined to join us there, that you'd be more than welcome, of course, and that would also give you the opportunity to support the Daily Wire which you really might want to think about doing, especially because at the moment, all the people who are participating in that venture are under pretty sustained attack from YouTube and the Google puppet masters that are behind it. And God only knows what sort of weird radicals are, you know, um, nested in the crevices of that organization. And that's become rather dire recently. Um, I'm sure the discussion I have with Kelly here is going to be banned by YouTube, but probability that's really high because YouTube banned my discussion with Helen Joyce. And of course, Helen Joyce is, you know, just an, just a journalist for The Economist and a very well-regarded person. So what the hell does she know? So the probability that this talk will disappear upon its emergence is quite high. And the probability that my YouTube channel is going to go up in flames in the next year is also quite high. So anyways, having said all that, you might want to give some consideration to lending some support to the Daily Wire Plus platform because they're at least somewhat of an alternative. I know they're made out of reprehensible conservatives and, you know, fascists of all stripes, but compared to the woke mob and their carnivorous motivations, I think they're quite preferable. So you could join Kelly and I on the Daily Wire Plus platform if you're inclined to it. Kelly, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me today. Uh, I appreciate that very much. And it's it's good that you had an opportunity to share your experiences with everybody who's watching and listening. And Good luck. I hope the bloody, I hope the bloody tooth mob stays the hell away from you and 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 it allows you to continue what you're doing. And you know, um, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we go over to the Daily Wire Plus side. Thank you so much for having me. It was an absolute pleasure.